Well, this is it. The beginning weekend of the fall holy day blitz. <laughs> one, one holy day after another, after another, after another. Trumpets in two days. Then nine days later, the day of atonement. And then five days after that, the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day. Exciting period of time. It's got to be one of the most exciting aspects of God's whole plan when you realize it's launching with Monday. It's boom, 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 boom. And it's a culmination of all of the plans that God has made for the last millennia. And he and Jesus Christ are going to start pulling out all the stops as we're going to start hearing in some of the sermons that lead up to this. Before we begin today, uh, let me share a short story with you. There once was a preacher who was at, a, at an awards dinner and was asked to get up and give a short 10-minute talk. Anybody that knows anything about preachers, you don't ask any preacher to give a short anything. Well, we know the dangers of that involved in asking a preacher to give a short talk, and sure enough, it parlayed itself at this dinner. Anyway, after 20 minutes had passed for this short 10-minute speech, the preacher just kept on talking. Then after 35 minutes, the master of ceremonies got a little rap on the table with his gavel to try to bring it to his attention that he's speaking too long. The preacher basically ignored it and just kept right on talking. After 45 minutes, the master of ceremonies gave a little louder tap on the gavel a couple of three times and still didn't get his attention. Kept right on talking. After one hour, with no end in sight, the master of ceremonies banged his gavel as hard as he possibly could and the preacher just kept going on, preaching on. Finally, in a fit of rage, the master of ceremonies stood up, threw the gavel at the preacher, missed the preacher, hit a guy that had fallen asleep on the table next to him. (laughs) The guy was awakened by the gavel, whacking him on the head. The old man woke up, startled, and shouted, said, Hit me again, I can still hear him. (laughs) Sort of reminds me of a sermon I heard at the feast a few years ago in Oceanside. I will never, ever forget that. Everybody in the auditorium, including the auditorium manager, walked up to him, tried to get him off the stage, and he ignored him. It was incredible. This guy went like 35 minutes overtime, and he was the first speaker. So it's just it's crazy. Turn with me, if you would, over to Luke chapter 24. It has nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought it was funny. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll bet everyone in that room that day when that preacher was preaching probably hoped that something would cause him to stop speaking. You know, just because we hope for something, like this preacher to quit preaching, doesn't necessarily make it happen, does it? I want to rehearse a more serious story of hope this time. The story is found here in Luke chapter 24. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read a verse or two because I think most of you are aware of the story. I've used it in sermons in the past. It's a powerful story. The account takes place just after Jesus Christ's resurrection. It is Luke's account of two disciples of Christ who are walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were on their way to this town, and they were walking... And as they were walking, they were discussing the events surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. While they were walking and talking, they were joined by Christ, but they didn't know it was him. He kept it away from them who he was. And he commented to them, and he said, it appears that you're really sad about something. Why? What's going on? They told him how the chief priests and the rulers had conspired to have Jesus Christ crucified. And they basically were saying, where have you been that you wouldn't know and understand this? Let's pick it up here in Luke 24 and begin in verse 21. Luke 24, verse 21. And they're telling him, he said, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, talking about Christ. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. They had lost hope. And they seemed to be giving up. They weren't aware that Jesus Christ had been resurrected. There aren't too many things more devastating than having lost hope. If you've ever really hoped for something in your life, 
Hope that you're going to be cured. Hope that you're going to find a job. Hope that you're going to get restitution in something. And then it gets dashed. It just leaves you with a sick, empty feeling. For these two men, their only true hope in life was gone. Really gone. The one they had hoped for to be the Redeemer of Israel was in their minds dead. No hope now. For them, along with the death of Jesus Christ, came the death of this hope. Drop down to verse 25 of Luke 24. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And my Bible has an exclamation point in it. Jesus Christ was emphatic when he said this. He said, don't you know what you've read? Don't you understand what the prophets have been saying for millennia? That you've heard in the synagogues, that you've heard people teach and preach about? Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Don't you know the story plan? Don't you know what was planned? Don't you know what he taught himself? He said, I'm going to die, but yes, I'm going to be resurrected after three days. And you guys don't believe that. And beginning at Moses in verse 27, and all the prophets, he's saying the entire Bible. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus Christ said, you know what, guys, you've missed the boat. You missed the point. Everything that's been preached since Moses and all the prophets is all talking about this man dying. Talking about himself. And how he was going to become the Savior because he was going to be resurrected. And he's going to pay the price for mankind's sins. He said, you guys didn't get that. Don't you understand that? Christ reminds them of all these scriptures that help maintain and create that hope that Jesus Christ said we all have to have. No matter what happens around us. Sometimes we may think of them and other times we may not. Turn over to Titus, if you would. Titus. Just after 1 and 2 Timothy. We have probably all, <clears throat> every one of us in this room, have lost hope at some point in time in our lives about something in our lives. Maybe it was something as silly as our favorite sports team that gets so far behind in a game that points that you know they're not going to end up winning the game. You just basically give up. <clears throat> I'm one of those kinds of fans. <laughs> if the game's going so bad against my team, it's like, I don't even want to watch this slaughter. But you know what? A few times I've been surprised that they've come back and win it, and I missed it. Maybe it's more serious, where there was a time when you were without a job and with little or no money. And you didn't know where your next meal was going to come from. You didn't know if you're going to have enough money to pay for your rent or your mortgage. We have a dear friend going through this right now, and he has been for months, almost a year. I've been there myself. We've been there ourselves. We know how difficult of a struggle that can be when you start losing hope that something's going to turn around. Maybe it's a health issue that you thought there was no hope for, for you or for a loved one maybe. Perhaps during those times you have wanted to take the advice of Job's wife to Job. Just curse God and die. Let's look at this short passage in Titus 1 and see a bit of how we can maintain our hope no matter what. Let's begin in Titus 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. God, before he even created man, had every intention of man to have eternal life. That powerful passage, that powerful concept, that powerful idea is what this whole fall Holy Day season is all about. And God and Jesus Christ and Paul were saying, this has to become your hope. Just as it was the hope of those two disciples who had lost hope. Paul uses this word hope three times in the book of Titus. The next one is in Titus 2. Let's turn there. Titus 2. It's interesting how Paul put it in Titus 1 verse 2. Hope 
of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful of powerful understanding. If we could just believe that God cannot lie and does not lie, you talk about hope. Think about it. If we could really come to truly believe everything that God has said about our lives, all the promises that he's made, what kind of hope would that be in our being? We would never fear. We would never get down. We'd never get depressed. We'd never lose hope. We'd, never, we'd be on top of the world all the time because we know he's going to come through no matter what. Let's look again here in Titus uh, 2 and begin in verse 11. Here we'll see more aspects of our godly hope. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, as we heard in the sermonette, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. Then for the third time, Paul discusses our hope. Turn over one page to Titus 3. So we just saw that another aspect of our hope given to Titus was the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've heard me mention of it many times in the past, how one of the things that's on my bucket list, but I'm not so sure I want to get that far on my bucket list because of what I have to go through to get there, would be how magnificent it would be to actually be alive, still alive on this earth when Jesus Christ returns. To see that incredible sight, him coming down out of heaven in his glory, with his army, on his white stallion, ready to take over this earth. I just can't even imagine anything more unbelievable than that in my life. But let's pick up, and that's what Trumpets is all about in just about two days, and we're going to hear a lot about that on Trumpets. Pick up the next passage here in Titus 3 and begin in verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Paul brings us back around to the hope of eternal life. You know, I've talked to people in my years as a minister, <clears throat> counseling with them, and I've actually had people tell me that this physical life is so miserable, they don't want to live forever. They don't want that eternal life. When a person makes a comment like that, they don't understand. They don't get what God is telling us. They don't get what God is teaching us. Eternal life, when God gives it to us, is going to be an eternal life of peace, joy, happiness, contentment, excitement enthusiasm, everything positive that we can think about in life. And if we don't have it now, that's one of the means by which God can te teach us to be looking forward to this other life, a renewed life, a sustained life, an energetic life, a life with no pain, a life with no tears, a life with no, no, no sorrow. That's what he wants us to see. That's what he wants us to know. That's what he wants us to understand. Not unlike those two disciples that Jesus Christ had to remind of the many, many scriptures throughout the entire Bible to provide our hope. And sometimes I think we forget about what the prophets have said about Jesus Christ and his eternal position in life and what it means to each one of us. Hope is probably as necessary, hope is probably as necessary to the human spirit as oxygen is to the human body. If you stop and think about it. That's one of the reasons why we did that breathing exercise in the health and fitness challenge. Getting more oxygen into your body strengthens your body. It makes you stronger. Having more hope in your life makes us stronger. Because we are able to get over the humps of life, over the challenges of life, because we've got this hope to look forward to, to keep moving forward about. Turn now to Romans 15. Romans 
15. When we lose all hope, we can become over we can become overcome with feelings of senselessness, purposelessness, discouragement, even despair and depression as a result of this loss. Lack of hope can actually have a destructive impact on our very human lives and can throw us into depression, as it happened to Elijah. Elijah was a King Kong of his day when it comes to prophets. Yet Elijah was thrown into deep depression, asking God to kill him. God talks a lot about the concept of hope in our Christian lives. The word hope occurs 52 times in the New Testament. And if you take the time to look up those 52 passages, you will find that it almost always is connected in some way to God. God, as we're going to see here in Romans 15, is the author of hope. Let's just read one verse here in Romans 15. Romans 15, verse 13. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry to keep repeating myself. But this shows us the link to Pentecost in our lives. The power of God's spirit is the means by which we can develop this hope. No other means. We can't muster it. We can't work it up. We can't talk it up. It's got to come via God's Holy Spirit. And with God's Holy Spirit not being utilized, that hope's not going to be present. It just keeps getting better, though. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul just kept talking about the hope that we can all live with. He was excited about it. He used it as a motivation constant in his life and wanted to constantly remind us of what it means. In the book of Acts alone, which we've been studying, Paul discusses the concept of hope eight different times. It was essential to spiritual well-being. It was part of his being. It was like his spiritual DNA. Once he developed this hope after interacting with Jesus Christ personally, he never lost track of it. And he went through a lot more than any of us will ever go through. And he still stayed on top of the heap, stayed ahead of the edge, kept hoping, kept inspiring himself, kept inspiring other people. Let's look at... 2 Thessalonians 2 and see some more of what I mean here. Let's actually begin in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15 to pick up the context of this passage. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by the epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace... Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. He gets back to the power of the Holy Spirit being the key to our hope and how we are able to benefit of this hope in our lives. If we are down, if we're having difficulties, if we are discouraged, if we're having all these challenges in life that drag us down, and you all know what I mean when you feel like that, we need to get back to God. And tap into his Holy Spirit. It's the source by which we can be re-energized. Just like if we can increase the intake of our lungs with oxygen, it energizes our body. It's the exact same concept. The power of the Holy Spirit is this key. Let's turn back to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. We'll see how this is expressed. We're going to see how Paul uses hope three times here in Colossians 1. Two of them tying Christ... Christ living in us to this hope. Again, like we heard at Pentecost. The power of Jesus Christ living in us. He's taken up residence in us. That's why he said, you're never going to be orphans. I'm with you. I'm always with you. I'm only a thought away for encouragement, for hope, for guidance, for direction, for comfort, for for anything we need in our lives. 
Again, this is a rehearsal of Pentecost as we make our way to trumpets and then on to tabernacles. It all links together. And the more we tap into God's Holy Spirit, the more hope we will have. The first use of hope here in Colossians 1 refers to the fact that the hope is a motivating factor in our behavior as saints. Let's begin in Colossians 1 and verse 3. Colossians 1 verse 3. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. What Paul is telling them, he said, I can see what happens when you actually latch on to this hope. This hope becomes so much a part of your being that you start caring for all the saints. Because why? Because you want your brothers and sisters to join you in that hope. It's so exciting to you and what it ultimately means to you that you want it to be exciting to them. So you start caring for them because of this hope that you have. This hope is something that God and Jesus Christ and Paul and virtually everybody else in the Bible wants us to grasp a hold of and wants us to really get emblazoned into our minds, which is why I love the fall Holy Day season. You talk about creating hope, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, last great day. I mean, it's hope, 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 hope. Every aspect of it. Do you know why it doesn't affect us the way it does some others? We don't really believe it. It's pure and simple. It's not real to us. Because if it were real to us, it would change the way we live. It would change the way we behave. It would change the way we react to one another. It's an incredible, incredible thing. Paul knew of their faith and he knew of their love. And it was tied to the hope of God waiting inside of them. And he could see it and he knew it. It was a motivator for them in their lives. It was the thing that kept them going. It's the thing that kept them excited. Sure, I'm having a bad time. Sure, I lost my job. Sure, this happened to me. Sure, that happened to me. But guess what? I'm going to have eternal life. Jesus Christ is going to return and straighten out all this mess. And he's going to make me whole. It's believing that. That's the toughie. But it goes way beyond just them. Verse 6. Which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Everywhere, when the knowledge of this hope exists, people's lives are changed. And they begin to exemplify a life with Jesus Christ, just like us. Again, as we heard in the sermonette today, one of the most powerful aspects of our being that we have control over is the way we act. When we act like true Christians, loving, caring, nurturing, encouraging, helping one another, and it's a constant way of life with us, people around us see this. And again, as we heard in the sermonette, I mean, the Gentiles are going to look at this even if they don't like us. They're going to say, you know, but i got to give them this. They really are a great group of people. They like doing good things for each other and for all of mankind. Let's flip back to Romans 15 again. Actually, no, let's stay in Colossians. Stay in Colossians 1. Drop down to verse 21. Here we will see this hope as a key to continued growth and development as a Christian. Colossians 1, verse 21. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, 
grounded steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope. Not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, which, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He said, this hope is what pushed me over the edge. This hope is what made me want to do this. Drop down to verse 26. Here Paul ties this hope to a mystery, which has now been defined. Colossians 1, verse 26. The mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. I wonder if we understand that. Paul himself was saying, this has been a mystery. Nobody's understood this, what this hope is all about. But you've been given the opportunity to know this. To them... God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you were to tell people, do you got Jesus Christ living in you? Some people that don't believe in God, right? You think you're nuts. They did back then, they do now. But it's, that's the key. That's the key to all of this. This all goes back to what we've been discussing ever since Pentecost, Jesus Christ living in us, which is a huge, huge concept to understand. So over and over and again, we see their, their hope is connected to the relationship with Jesus Christ. Now back to Romans 15. Romans 15. Hope is what connects us with our future. Hope is what connects us with our future. Just as memories connect us with our past. I can remember many times that I've had some really enjoyable and exciting moments in my life with friends of mine and family of mine. We've been so high at times that we're just like, can't even believe it, how good you feel. And I remember a couple of times, buddies of mine saying, you know, this isn't going to last probably, but one thing mankind, anybody can never take away from us is the memory of what we just experienced. And that's a positive thing, a really positive thing, to go back and think about those wonderful moments of time we've had in our lives with other human beings. That's what this hope is supposed to be doing for us for the future. We know through our memories... And we can think back to what happened. This is what hope does for our future. We have promises. We have hope of promises which are linked to our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has made possible for us. Sure, there are going to be valleys, just as there have been valleys in the past, and there's going to be valleys in the future. But there's also going to be peaks coming out of those valleys. So how is this hope that Paul is referring to developed? Here in Romans 15, we'll get a glimpse of how and why this hope is developed through Jesus Christ living in us. Let's pick it up in Romans 15 and verse 1. Romans 15, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples or weaknesses of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. That's having an outward concern for other people as opposed to an inward concern for just about us. This caring focus is something that Paul refers to a lot in his epistles. How we treat and respect each other, and we're going to see that this is also tied to our hope. Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Then we see how this hope is developed. Verse 4, for whatever things were written before, talking about the entirety of the Bible, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That's the message from cover to cover. This is the same hope that Paul discussed in Titus, in Colossians, in Thessalonians, And now we see why God has provided this hope. Verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ. 
that you may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been given this hope so that we can stay encouraged and concerned about others and what they need is a dose of hope in our lives. This hope can actually help us start caring more about other people. And we don't have to keep worrying about us because we know God's got us covered. And again, I say I don't believe most of us actually really truly believe this down to our core, including myself. I mean, I would love to have this very, very, very real to me. It's one of the things I pray for about as much as anything, that and discouragement. (laughs) Because I don't have the hope. Because it's not real to me. Not real enough. I know it can be, because I read about it everywhere else in the Bible. Paul had it, James had it, Peter had it, Christ had it. I want it. I would assume you do too. As we see here in Romans 15, the scriptures were given for us to be able to provide hope for us. The stories of old give us hope. We may think that our problems are unique to ourselves, but there's been someone else who's gone through the exact same thing, if not worse, before us. God ministered to them, and God will minister to us the exact same way. We have to believe that. The same God, Jesus Christ, who dealt with those saints of old, deals with us. Just as Jesus Christ dealt with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just as Jesus Christ dealt with Daniel. Just as Jesus Christ dealt with Joseph. Just as Jesus Christ dealt with Elijah. It's the same interaction that he's having with us. And what did he do for each one of them? He brought them unto the hope again. He gave them the encouragement they needed. He gave them the guidance that he, they needed. And he reinstilled this hope in their being, and it allowed them to keep moving forward positively. Let's turn to Romans 8 next. Just back a few pages as we begin to wrap things up here. While we're returning to Romans 8, let me ask you a couple of questions. Please, no hands. Are you ever lonely or depressed? Look at Elijah, who thought he did not have a friend in the world. He thought he was the only one who still believed and stood for God. But Elijah found that God was still with him, that God was there, and he was not alone. God showed Elijah that things were not as bad as Elijah thought. We can take hope from this and learn from this. Have you ever been frightened? Ever have something in your life that has gotten out of control and brought fear into your being? Look at David, who fought a nine foot six inch giant and beat him. Just as God was with David, there's no need to be afraid because God is on our side and with us as well. As the Bible states, if God is for us, who can be against us? Have you ever been treated unfairly? What about Joseph? He was treated unfairly by virtually everybody. He was treated unfairly by his family, by Potiphar's wife, by Potiphar himself, and the list goes on. Yet his hope was not in what was happening to him. His hope was in God. And it got him through it. Have you ever been in a crisis situation? Talk about crisis. How would you like to be facing a fiery furnace? or a group of hungry lions with nowhere to turn. That's where Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel found themselves. What did they do? They prayed because they knew where their hope was. It was in God, and it was in Jesus Christ, and it got them through it. These stories and more throughout the Bible are given to us that we might have hope. It's just not an interesting story. It's a story of God intervening in the lives of those people whom he's working with. Including every person sitting in this room. Let's again see what Paul states here in Romans 8. He tells us how willing God is to provide for us and do things for us. 
This is sort of a capstone on this whole concept of hope that was so pervasive in all of Paul's writings. It's like a summary of God and Christ's commitment to him of promises and love for each and every one of us. Let's begin Romans 8 and verse 31. I'm going to read this portion from the New Living Translation so it may sound different. Just sit back and listen if you want to listen to these wonderfully inspiring and hope-filled words. Romans 8 verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? He had just discussed earlier in Romans 8 (laughs) that we are all family members of God's family. Verse 32, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? It's like you've been promised everything. Take hope in that, is what Paul is trying to encourage us to do. Then he goes on into detailed discussions about God's love for us. Verse 33. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. You notice the theme there? For us, for us, for us. Only reason he came to this earth. For us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No matter what it seems like, he's always there, in other words. Verse 36, as the scriptures say, for your sake, we were killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep, referring to Psalm 44, verse 22. In other words, no matter what happens in life, Christ has already conquered everything for our sakes. He said, I've taken care of all that for you. Verse 37, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter what our situation, hope is there. The hope that is in Jesus Christ. The same Christ who laid down his life for us. Because we're his friends. That love ought to give us hope because that love demonstrates to us how much Jesus Christ cares for us. The love shows us how much God the Father cares for us and desires what is best for us. Brethren, when we realize that all of this has been done for us, that is being done for us. It continues every day of our lives and incredible promises that have been made to us. How can we not have hope? How can we not have hope that is so overwhelming, so powerful in our lives, that we just keep pushing forward with everything that we're facing? And we do it with a positive attitude. We do it without complaining. And we do it at the same time trying to encourage other people go through their own struggles. A hope in Jesus Christ returning to this earth and fixing everything that is broke. And there is a lot that needs fixing and is broke. A hope in living and working side by side with Jesus Christ for a thousand years restoring this earth. A hope in God changing everything and relocating his kingdom here to this earth. A hope in living eternally in happiness, in peace, and the greatest love that has ever existed. Now that's something to hope for. Have a great Sabbath.